In this video, we're going to go over some examples of how to work with the empirical gas laws. So if you remember, the empirical gas laws are things like Boyle's Law and Charles' Law, and these can be derived from the ideal gas law. To get us started, we can write down the universal gas law, which is that P1V1 over N1T1 is equal to P2V2 over N2T2. And we said that we can write this because both of these are going to be equal to R, right? So no matter what we do to the pressure volume, the number of moles, and the temperature for a gas, in the end, that is going to have to equal R. So if we change it from one condition to another, those two conditions can be set equal to each other because they're both going to have to equal that value of 0.0821. Okay, so what we're going to do, though, is we're actually going to apply this universal gas law to a couple of different examples here. Uh, we're going to look at the Boyles and the Charles, the Avogadro you can do on your own. Uh, so with the boils, it says a sample of CO2 occupies a volume of 20 liters at 23 degrees Celsius in one atmosphere. Calculate the volume of the sample at 23 degrees Celsius and 0 0.830 atmospheres. So a good starting point with any of these, um, what you're looking for with these empirical gas law problems, and the way this is going to work is you basically, it's going to say, okay, you've got a gas and you're doing something to change it. You're going to be changing some of the variables. That's how you know that you're working with an empirical gas law problem, right? So, so it says calculate the volume of the sample at a different pressure. And then now you know, okay, I've got to set up these empirical gas laws. So let's look at what's being held constant and what's varying. So in this case, the temperature, you can see that in the first one, the temperature is 23 degrees Celsius, and then it says calculate the volume at 23 degrees Celsius. So the temperature is being held constant. And what they're varying is they're definitely varying the pressure because we're going from one atmosphere to 0 0.830 atmosphere. So we're varying the pressure and we want to know what the volume is. So the volume is going to vary also. We have a volume of 20 liters and then we want to know what the volume of the sample is at some other pressure. Now the question is, what about the number of moles? Well, in this case, the number of moles are also a constant. If you look at the problem, it says a sample of CO2 occupies, and then it, then it says the volume of the same sample uh, at a different pressure. So we're not changing, this sample is not gaining or losing gas molecules. We're not adding or losing CO2 molecules. So the number of moles is also being held constant in this case. So we're gonna set up our equation here, and from the universal, we can see that that the, the number of moles and the temperature are being held constant. So we can drop those two out. So for this one, the N and the T and the N and the T on the right and the left are going to go away because they're held constant. So we can simply write P1V1 is equal to P2V2 for this particular problem. And that just helps us because now all we have to do is just solve for the most relevant variables. Okay, so now the next thing I like to do is I like to just put what my P1 and my V1 are and what my P2 and V2 are, first condition and second condition. And my advice for these problems and for all of gas laws is to always convert to the standard units. Even it, technically in these empirical gas law problems, you don't have to do that. You can leave them in the non-standard units because the units will cancel out for the most part. The only exception is temperature, and we'll look at that in the next problem. For the most part, my recommendation is always just to go to standard units. And then that way, whether you're doing PV equals NRT or an empirical gas law, you can't go wrong. So in this case, the pressure is already in standard units of atmosphere. So our first condition has 1.00 atm, and our second condition has 0 0.830 atm. Our first volume is 20 liters, and our second volume is the question mark. That's what we don't know. So we're going to solve for this by plugging in uh, 1.00 atmospheres times 20 liters is going to equal 0 0.830 atmospheres times V2. And if you solve for V2, now the good thing to do is always to do a check at the very end to make sure that, you know, you did the calculation right. So what did we do here? We basically decreased the pressure. So what should happen to the volume? If we decrease the pressure, the volume should increase, and it does. Uh, so that checks us off. So our volume went from 20 to 24, and we know that pressure and volume have an indirect relationship because the pressure in PV equals NRT, these two are on the same side. So that should be an indirect. Now let's look at the Charles Law example. So we're going to set up our what's being held constant and what's varying. 
So in this case, a sample of, C of O2 occupies uh, a volume of 4.38 decimeters cubed. I know this is a volume because decimeters cubed is a derived unit and it's in cubed space, so that's a volume, at 19 degrees Celsius and at 101 kPa. Calculate the volume at 25 degrees Celsius and 101 kPa. Well, the pressure is definitely being held constant. They didn't say anything about changing the number of moles, so that's a constant. And now, what, what are we changing? Well, we're changing the temperature and the volume. So that's Charles' law. So if we want to derive an equation for this, we're going to write our variables down that are not changing. That, that, I'm sorry, we're going to eliminate our variables that are not changing. So the pressure and the number of moles are going to go away. So this gives us V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2 as our variables. And in this case, I'm going to set up my, var my variables into standard units. So we have V1, T1, and we have V2, T2. So the volume is 4.38 decimeters cubed. And if you remember back, one decimeter cubed is equal to one liter. Basically, this is the same thing. So this is the same thing as 4.38 liters. If you don't remember that, go back to chapter one and look at the video on derived units and look at the video on volume. That will help you out with remembering that. One decimeter cubed is equal to one liter. So this was a simple conversion um, where it's just one to one. Now the temperature is a little bit more complicated. I have to convert my temperatures to Kelvin, no matter what, whether it's an empirical gas law or the, the universal gas law, you always have to convert to Kelvin. So we're gonna do 19 degrees Celsius plus 273.15, and this is gonna equal 292.15 Kelvin. And our other temperature is going to be 25 degrees Celsius plus 273.15. This is gonna give us 298.15 Kelvin. So now the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna set this up, we're gonna plug our numbers in, and then we're gonna solve for V2. So our V1 is 4.38 liters. Our T1 is 292.15 Kelvin. And this is gonna equal V2, which we don't know. And our second temperature is 298.15 Kelvin. So if you solve for V2, you get 4.46 liters. And that's our answer. What we're going to do again is we're going to do a little check at the end to make sure that we are, you know, that everything worked out okay and that our calculation was right. So in this case, we're increasing the temperature and we want to know what should happen to the volume. Well, PV equals NRT. Volume and temperature on, are on opposite sides of the equation. So this should be a direct relationship. So what we would expect is that the volume should go up. And that's what we see. The volume in this case is going from 4.38 to 4.46. So that checks with our understanding of the ideal gas law. So this just shows you how to work with some um, empirical gas law problems using the universal gas law and how to do those calculations.